You know, for the first time, you can use AI not just to do more work, but to quietly reprogram the conditions of your workday, which means fewer interruptions, faster recovery, and tasks that actually fit into the time you have. The inspiration for this post is an engineering systems thinking blog from John Duruk. It's fantastic. I'm going to link to it, but I'm also going to give you like the cliff notes, two minute summary here at the top of the video. So you know what I'm referring to as I get into how I use AI to get more work. Okay. Who is John Duruk? He is a longtime engineer. He's a founder, co-founder at Felt, XUber, Dig, et cetera. And he really is a systems engineer. Don't think of him as a productivity coach. And you can figure out why he's a system engineer and not a productivity coach when you see how he writes about productivity, because it's all mathematically inclined. I'm going to give it to you without the need for math. Basically, he says there are three key dials that you can turn that determine your day. The first is how often you're interrupted per hour. He gives that a Greek letter he calls lambda. The second is how long it takes your brain to get back on task after an interruption. He calls that delta. And the length of an uninterrupted block of time that is enough for it to be real work. How many minutes is it for it to be real work and you're not interrupted during that time? He calls that theta. So forget the Greek letters. You don't need to know those. But if you use those three parameters, you can actually see ahead of time whether your day is likely to be productive or not. You can look at your day and say, wow, I have no un uninterrupted blocks. Like I, we have engineered the productivity out of my day. And that is actually his larger point is that when you look at studies by Microsoft of all, of all companies, you see that for people who are heavy coordinators at work, they get interrupted on the average of every two minutes. And if you think about it, if you get an interruption every two minutes during the workday, if it takes you 10 minutes to get back on task, you're in negative territory every single day, which explains a lot of how we all feel. So the first contribution he makes is just to turn the idea of I can't focus into a model that we can talk about, engineer, and think about. And I think that's a great gift. And I would argue that this framing is actually pretty empowering because it reminds us that focus is an engineering problem. Focus is not a willpower problem. Focus is not, I'm not disciplined enough, right? Focus is what is the expected number of focus blocks that are sufficient for productivity in the day? If it's zero at the start of the day, I shouldn't expect magic. The other thing I want to call off is that this is a model that is susceptible to nonlinear benefits from small changes, which is a fancy way of saying, if you care about getting more deep work done, you should tweak the knobs of your day pretty aggressively because even small changes can lead to really significant upside for you. So as an example, the same 155 minutes of focus can yield four units of work if your theta length, if your deep work length is 30 minutes, but only three units if your theta length is 45 minutes. But if you tweak that length of focus just a little bit, you can squeeze in another unit of work at 45 minutes. It's not that far away. Tiny shifts in lambda and delta, tiny shifts in the number of interruptions and how long it takes to come back on task can flip days from statistically no deep work to three real blocks of work without really increasing your hours work. And really that comes back to the idea that deep work is a design choice. It's not a moral high ground, right? It's not a moral bar. If your internal standard for real work is I need 90 uninterrupted minutes and your job statistically only gives you 20 or 30 minute chunks, your capacity is mathematically forced to zero almost every day. You can respond by lowering your standards, but there's a much more interesting move here. You can keep your theta honest for the hard work and redesign tasks so more of your contribution can be done in smaller and well-scaffolded pieces. And that's where tools and AI start to matter. And so this is not an ex a sort of video about a magical workplace that none of us work in where interruptions cease. I don't want you to take that away. This is actually a very practical video where we look at work and focus as an engineering problem and then ask ourselves how AI can be a super lever that helps us to move that entire work system into a more positive environment for ourselves. The fourth thing that he calls out in the blog post that I think is really relevant for us to keep in mind as we get into the AI portion of this, he makes it obvious that the, the interruption level is a culture setting, not a personal trait, right? So Lambda is driven by meeting norms. It's driven by DM etiquette. It's driven by Slack channel sprawl, right? It's driven by just a quick question behavior. If you are a manager, that can feel like really positive news because the biggest productivity lever in the model is something you can change via your social norms. You don't have to beg people to be more disciplined. You can just choose not to Slack them. You can choose to leave them be. All of this 
sets the stage for AI in a way that feels useful. AI becomes interesting because it can help us turn the dials at scale. It doesn't just give us one more tab to work on. Now, you might wonder why does AI belong in this picture at all? Because more AI at work stories usually jump to, look, the model can do stuff. I would argue that John Durek's model invites a very different question that's more useful. If the limiting factor on our deep work is these three variables of lambda, delta, and theta, how often we're interrupted, when we come back to it, how long it takes, and, and how long our deep work takes, where can AI actually usefully push those numbers in the right direction? Interestingly enough, AI is often unusually good at exactly the things that sit around those three knobs. It's good at monitoring and routing, so it can watch streams of messages, it can classify urgency, it can decide what gets through. That's something we've actually seen in startups that are starting to declutter the inbox on exactly those principles. It can summarize and recall, right? It can compressed past context into something that you can reload very quickly and efficiently so you don't miss something, but it doesn't interrupt you. It can also decompose and scaffold out very easily, right? It can turn big fuzzy tasks into smaller executable ones, which is one of the things that Doodle calls out as a big hack around Theta. And so instead of AI as a productivity boost abstractly, I want you to think of AI as a focus system tool. I want you to think of AI as a tool that helps you choose when and how often people are allowed to knock on your door. Or AI as a tool that remembers the work state you had so your brain can reboot quickly and doesn't have to do a full reload. If you've ever loaded up a past chat GPT chat and scanned it and said, now I know where I am, you've done this. For Theta, this is about changing the shape of the work so it can fit into more finite blocks of time. It's like carving it into useful chunks. This is a much more useful way of thinking about AI and productivity than adding a chatbot to Slack, guys. So let me give you a few strategies that come out of this for me. And if you're wondering, yes, I actually use these strategies, what I am giving you is both, both the theoretical framework that Duruk outlines and also my personal productivity approach that I have derived based on optimizing my own productivity settings with AI. So strategy number one, use AI for fewer smarter interruptions. The obvious play is just to stop notification firewalls. An agent can sit on Slack, Teams, and email and auto answer trivial questions. It can bundle non-urgent pings. It can break through in real time only when it really matters. I do this all the time. It doesn't even have to be a super uh, aggressive AI. As superhuman has an AI that looks at what's important and what's not important. That helps me a lot. That's not super hard to set up. You just set up your superhuman instance, right? Same for meetings. An AI scheduler agent can auto propose async updates. It can route status checks to a doc and it can push back on your calendar spam by default. Again, this is often built into good email clients. It's increasingly something that you can get out of box. Now there are real trade-offs here. You are making a conscious trade to have slower replies and the occasional misclassified email or the occasional misclassified Slack ping in exchange for fewer total interruptions. You are taking some risk. Some people will read a slower response as somewhat standoffish. But at the end of the day, if you're getting deep work done, the trade-off you're making is that the actual productivity will be worth it. I realize that's not true for everyone, but for many of us, being able to do the deep work is what leads to the transformational benefit, both for our own mental wellness and also, frankly, for the things that we're working on, the company we're working for, or even if we're working for ourselves. So strategy one is really use AI any way you can to shut off interruptions. And there really are a lot of tools. I, I've mentioned superhuman, but lindy.ai helps you with this. There are other tools out there as well. Uh, and I'm going to assemble a whole list for the Substack that will help you on the the productivity and, and interruption side so that you can actually focus. Strategy number two, use AI to shrink your delta, to get back into the problem faster. Use it to load context more quickly. At the simple end, you can just ask the model, what was I working on last? And because most models now remember past conversations, that works well. Claude does, ChatGPT does. At the more agentic end, you could actually set up a context agent that snapshots what you're editing and reading and comes back with a task log. I haven't personally felt the need to go that far. I find that if I can search through my past chats and I have kept good notes and I can reload that context quickly, it is good enough. It depends on you and what you need to boot your brain back with context. The key is making sure that you consciously remember to ask for the context you need to boot quickly and that you constantly note take, whether it's through vocal sort of granola note taking or whether it's through typing, 
or whether it's through summarizing in your handwriting in the notebook, right? Whatever it is, make sure you get something that reduces your future reload time. And I wasn't kidding about the notebook. I have a physical notebook. And if I need to remember what I was doing, I can flip the page very quickly to two days ago. And as funny as it sounds, that's not necessarily AI, but it does reboot that context very quickly. And of course, if I want to, AI can also take a picture of that read it and give me a summary of what was useful from the day before. One of the ways I've actually used that is when I've had a page of handwritten notes in a meeting and I'm like looking through it and I can't find what I'm looking for because my handwriting is so bad. AI handwriting recognition is good enough now that I can take a picture and I can get the AI to read my handwritten notes for me and say, oh, that was the thing you were thinking about. Helps reload context fast. Strategy three, use AI to fit more work into realistic real world blocks. So if your minimum time to do deep work is 90 minutes and you have very few of those blocks, can you chunk your work into 20 to 40 minute chunks? AI is really helpful here. The model can generate tests and logging and boilerplate when it comes to code. We've talked about that. The model can do outlines for writing. The model can structure headings. It can do research for you. The model can do a first pass on a document. Now, if you take this too far, you can end up with a day that's composed of so many AI-assisted micro tasks that you have no mental model of the whole problem anymore. And then you lose your human taste, right? You can also have AI that doesn't decompose correctly so the chunks are not the right size for actual deep work. But what I have found in practice is that the chunking strategy is actually one of the easiest to employ here. Like you might have to install a tool to not get interrupted. You might have to really think about how to get back into the problem quicker and do deep, different note-taking strategies. But for using AI to make work chunkable, that's as simple as saying, I have this whole thing to do. Give me some ideas to chunk it, right? Like it's actually a very effective way forward. Duruk's most powerful idea is that leaders should treat focus like uptime for engineers. So they should define service levels for deep work blocks and manage toward them. I think that's really powerful if you're managing an engineering team. I also think it's completely unworkable if you are in some other job roles, because other job roles, your job is the meeting, right? But I think the idea of taking focus seriously and measuring against it is still meaningful. And one of the things AI can help us with here is learning to read a calendar and actually measure our deep work. And so we are at a point now where if you color code your calendar and you tell an AI, please read this calendar for my deep work blocks, it can do it. You can also extend that very easily into a vibe coded app for your whole team, or you can do it without a vibe coded app just by grabbing screenshots and loading them in with a good prompt. I'm going to build a prompt for this. It is not difficult to actually measure. And I think Duduk has a point that what we measure, we care about, and we can start to think about if we work on teams, how we optimize for deeper work. If you put this all together, you get a pretty simple menu, right? At the individual level, we can use prompts, we can use built tools, we can use simple automation to get into context quicker and to lower our effective theta, right? To make it easier by decomposing problems with AI to get more work done. We can also slightly reduce our interruptions by using personal notification rules or maybe some simple ways of working that reduce interruption continually over time. It's as simple sometimes as turning off Slack, right? It's not all AI. But at the team level, we also need culture changes. And that's something that we can start to advocate for, especially if you're in management. This is something you can just start to roll out to help your team. You can agree on Slack and meeting norms that aim to target less interruptions. You can adopt shared resumption patterns, such as every spec, every PR has a here's where to pick this up section and AI helps to maintain it. That's helpful for engineers. You can have similar rituals on the non-technical side where you have here's how to ramp into this context at the top of a particular page if someone has to pick up work. The thing that I want to leave you with, uh, this has been key for my productivity and it's something that came out a lot in this, in this essay by Duruk as well. And it's something that I think AI really helps us with. You do not have to treat your focus as a mystical personal trait that some people have. An AI is the shiny add-on over the top. I hear this a lot from people. People will say, Nate, how do you get so much done? And they treat me like I'm a magical person with magical AI. I'm not. Treat your attention like a system with dials and treat AI as a lever that helps you to turn those knobs more efficiently first for yourself and then for your team. And if you work and lead an org, eventually for your whole org. Empowerment is not really about I try harder in this situation. It's about I understand the system 
that leads to focus and deep work, and I have a set of AI-enabled levers, I can start pulling. That has been my goal with this video. I'm going to put some prompts together to help you with that, get some tools together. I want this to be a toolkit that enables deep work for you. Best of luck with uh, actually getting work done and not getting interrupted by Slack.